Winter and I serve as president of Muscatine Community College and I have the privilege to introduce to you this year's Alexander Clark Lecture Series speaker, Dr. Paul Finkelman. Uh, Paul has had a busy day already today. He addressed a history class at Muscatine uh, Community College this morning. We had him as a guest speaker at our weekly Rotary meetings. And then I know he's been meeting with uh, members of the Alexander Clark Foundation as well. So we are thrilled that he is returning to Muscatine after visiting here in 2010 and actually launched our Alexander Clark Lecture Series. Um, Dr. Finkelman is the Robert E. and Susan T. Rydell Visiting Professor at Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota. And he is a specialist in American legal history, constitutional law, law and religion, slavery, civil rights and race relations, civil liberties, African American history, American constitutional history, the American Civil War, and legal issues surrounding baseball. The United States Supreme Court has quoted and cited his work in six decisions, as have numerous other federal and state courts, including the one here in Iowa, as recently as 2020 and 2021. He has lectured on human trafficking, and on human rights issues at the United Nations, throughout the United States, and in more than a dozen other countries. In 2014, he was ranked as the fifth most cited legal historian in American legal scholarship in Brian Leiter's scholarly impact survey. So our partners, uh, along with Muscatine Community College. Our partners are the Community Foundation of Greater Muscatine and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security, members of the Alexander Clark uh, Foundation Board. We welcome you and we know that you will enjoy the presentation by Dr. Paul Finkelman. Thank you. Thank, uh, can you all hear me? No. Um, Let's see if we can figure out how to get this. Uh, my mic here is supposed to be working, but. Let's, let's see if, can you hear? Hello, can you hear me now? Now they can hear me. The wonders of electronic technology. So th first of all, I want to thank uh, President DeWinter and uh, the Muscatine community for inviting me here. Uh, I have been here two or three times in the past, including uh, having the honor of giving what was then an Alexander Clark lecture. Little did I know it was going to be the first Alexander Clark lecture in a series of lectures. So. It is nice to have been there at the beginning and see that it has prospered and grown and uh, become important. So all of you have some idea who this guy is. Uh, he is arguably um, the most important resident of Muscatine, Iowa in the history of the city. And he is also arguably somebody that most of America and much of Iowa has never heard of. And um, part of the project here is to change that. Uh, I have just written a, what will be a book chapter um, on uh, unknown, it's a book about unknown black leaders of the 19th century uh, and my title of my chapter is the most important African-American leader who almost no one has heard of. And that is Alexander Clark. And so what I want to do today is talk about why people should have heard of him, why people should hear him, and why he is important, why, why this city makes a big deal about him. This is a small group. It's a friendly group. Feel free to raise your hand while I'm speaking. Uh, this does not have to be a formal lecture. This can be very informal. 
uh, and I think that works better. So if you've got questions, raise your hands. Any questions so far? I'll tell you about baseball later if you really want to know. Okay. Um, so uh, in the fall of 1867, Alexander Clark, a businessman, civil rights activist in Muscatine, tried to enroll his 13-year-old daughter Susan in the local secondary school. Um, Susan had just graduated from the city's ungraded elementary school uh, that was segregated and available for black children. But there was no secondary school for blacks in Muscatine. And apparently, no blacks had ever tried to go to the Muscatine secondary schools. Why is this would be the first question we would ask. And the answer is because in the 1860s, not that many people went to secondary schools. Uh, in fact, as late as 1900, um, it's pretty clear that more than half of the people in the United States never attended high school. Uh, I think my family may be a good example of that. I had four immigrant grandparents. One of them went to high school. The other three never went to a high school. So that was a fairly common pattern. And it was also a fairly common pattern that people who were um, financially struggling didn't send their kids to secondary schools. They sent them to work. Alexander Clark, by this time, is not financially struggling. He is a businessman. He uh, is an entrepreneur. He is involved in real estate. He is uh, an up-and-coming example of American entrepreneurship uh, at a very high level. And one of the issues of letting people know more about Alexander Clark is to let them understand that he is a figure of national significance. And one reason why he could be considered a figure of national significance, this is not something that, that the folks here in Muscatine have started focusing on, but I think it's time we think about this, is that he is probably among the top 50 black entrepreneurs of the mid-19th century and might be in the top 20. I mean, you know, no, nobody's done the research to figure it out. He certainly, we, we can say without a doubt, that on the eve of the Civil War, he is the most successful black entrepreneur west of the Mississippi River. Now, that may be a limited category, but nevertheless, it's significant. We could also probably make the argument that he is one of the most successful black entrepreneurs in the entire Midwest. So 1867, he thinks his daughter should go to the next level of schooling. And um, Alexander Clark does what Americans have been doing as long as there have been people coming to America when he doesn't get what he wants, he finds a good lawyer and he sues. Um, just to give you an idea, um, the average adult Puritan in Massachusetts in the 1600s was in about seven or eight lawsuits in his life. Uh, we are a very litigious people. Uh, I, I'll, so I'll, I'll throw in you know, my baseball thing now just as an aside. You know, baseball, I believe, is still our national sport, but litigation is probably our second national sport. <laughs> and um, we, we do this because Americans have had a long tradition that you have a right in this country to defend your rights. And that is something that people all over the world have always been envious of Americans for. That we can say what we want, we can ask for what we want, and we can defend our rights. We don't always win, we don't always get what we want. But that's not the point. And so Alexander Clark files a lawsuit against the board of directors of the Muscatine schools. And it ultimately goes to the 
Iowa Supreme Court with the weird title of Clark versus Board of Directors. If you looked at this without knowing what it's about, you would think it involved some manufacturing company and somebody suing uh, because the board of directors of the manufacturing company didn't give him what he wanted. But it's not that at all. And it is Alexander Clark suing, not his daughter Susan, because she is a minor, just as 90 years later, Linda Brown will not sue in Topeka, Kansas to go to school with white people. Her father will sue on her behalf in Brown versus Board of Education. That's simply the way these things are structured and set out. And in April 1868, the Iowa Supreme Court upholds a lower court decision, a Muscatine court decision, ordering the school to accept Susan as a student. And um, this is the first time in the history of the United States that a state court, both the local Muscatine Court and the Iowa Supreme Court, have declared that a school may not discriminate against students on the basis of race. Uh, so if there were no other reason why this guy matters, it's because he had the combination of intelligence, knowledge, which of course we all know are very separate things. You can be very bright and not have a lot of education, and you can be very well educated. Uh, you could even go to, I don't know, the Wharton School in Pennsylvania and not be very bright. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> Alexander Clark has both. He also has the ability and the contacts to know how to find a good lawyer, which is also not easy. Now today, of course, you just turn on the TV, and there are hundreds of them out there. Probably, if they're advertising on TV, you don't really want them. Uh, but he finds a good lawyer, and he brings his lawsuit. And that in itself is important. More importantly, he wins. Um, let me tell you just briefly about the first school desegregation case in the United States, which took place in Boston in 1850. There you have a very large black community. You have a number of very sophisticated white abolitionist lawyers. And in the case of Roberts versus City of Boston, the case goes to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court it is argued by Charles Sumner, who will later become a US senator from Massachusetts, will be the author of the 1875 Civil Rights Act, and is one of the most important advocates for equality in the history of the United States. He loses in Massachusetts. In Muscatine, you don't have a Charles Sumner, but you win. And why do you win? You win because the Iowa Supreme Court looks at the history of schooling in Iowa. And it notes that in 1846, the very first session of the Iowa legislature, following the admission to I of Iowa as a state, says the school shall, quote, be open and free alike to all white persons in the district between ages 5 and 21. So that's how Iowa begins. Now, why does it restrict it to white people? Because it is 1846. It is a world where the vast majority of African Americans are slaves. There are very few free blacks in the North and a significant population of Iowa comes from the slaveholding South. There are leaders of Iowa who are from Kentucky, who are from Tennessee, who have come up from Missouri. And so Iowa begins as kind of a quasi-Southern state. And so the legislature says, yeah, we want public schools for white kids. By the way, that would put Iowa ahead of places like Kentucky and Tennessee, which don't have public schools at all. Uh, and uh, to give you a, a sense of the 
the oddity of public education in America in 1860 in a number of northern states there is a higher percentage of black children in public schools than there are white children in a number of southern states. Uh, that is to say, uh, in Tennessee or Kentucky or Alabama or Mississippi, there are in public school systems. And in fact, on the eve of the Civil War, the only slave state with a really functional public school system is North Carolina. So Iowa is becoming a northern free state in the sense of creating a good public school system, but it hasn't yet thought much about racial equality. So that's 1846. 1857, Iowa writes a new constitution. This is, by the way, is a, a fairly common process for new states. You write a constitution, you become a state, you'll work under that constitution for a little while, 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, Illinois, for example, has a constitution in 1818. By 1848, they're writing a new constitution. You're figuring it all out. So the 1857 Iowa Constitution says, shall provide for the education of all the youths of the state through a system of common schools. It does not say anything about race. And so the Iowa Supreme Court says all the youths of the state will include black children as well as white children. And the court says that since 1857 there had been various statutes passed in Iowa, which provided for, quote, the instruction of youth between ages 5 and 21. By the way, it's interesting that they have, uh, you know, public school kids going to, to age 21, whereas at this institution, I met uh, some college students today who haven't yet finished high school. So they're much younger than that, and they're already getting a head start on college. So we've changed in that regard. Um, the court says in Iowa, the law makes no distinction whatever as to the right of children to attend the common schools and that there is no distinction left with or given to the board of school directors to make any distinction in regard to children within specified ages. Uh, by the way, the Boston case comes out differently because the Massachusetts school law says nothing about race, but it gives the school boards absolute discretion to decide who goes to which school. And so the Chief Justice of Massachusetts says the school board is free to do whatever it wants in Boston. Uh, at this point, all the schools in Massachusetts are integrated except the Boston schools. And so Mr. Roberts, on behalf of his daughter Sarah, loses. Uh, by the way, it's interesting that both the Roberts case, the Clark case, and the Brown case all have young girls as the plaintiffs rather than young men. And I think that might be because at least in Boston and perhaps in Muscatine, um, people are sending their young male kids to work earlier, but they can afford to send their daughter to greater schools. In any event, um, they lose in Boston. Five years later, through political agitation, through voting, because blacks can vote in Massachusetts, through coalition building, the state legislature changes the law and says you can't segregate. So there are different routes to the same result. So the court goes on to say, and I'm quoting the court at length here because I think it's important for you to see the way in which what Clark is doing in the bringing this case is not merely changing the law so his daughter can go to school. He is setting up the circumstances to begin to change American law in what will be a very long and painful struggle to reach racial equality in the United States. I would say it's a struggle that is not over and is continuing but it is a lot different than it was even when I was in high school or when many of us were growing up. So the court says that the discretion in the school law 
is limited to the ages, 5 to 21, but that the same rights apply to all people. And then in a remarkable passage, something that, that, the, uh, that the state of Iowa ought to put on a, on a monument somewhere, quoting its Supreme Court, but it's way too long to put it on a monument. So it should be taught in the schools. By the way, you should have a class on this here at, the, at this college. People should come out of Muscatine Community College knowing this because it's important to know your history. The court says, it is not competent for the board of directors to require the children of Irish parents to attend one school and the children of German parents to attend another, the children of Catholic parents to attend one school, the children of Protestant parents to attend another. And if it should so happen that there would be one or more poorly clad or ragged children in the district and public sentiment was opposed to intermingling with such with the well-dressed youths of the district in the same school, it would not be competent for the board of directors in their discretion to pander to such false public sentiment and require the poorly clothed children to attend a separate public school. The term colored race is but one designation, and this is, and in this country it is a synonym for African. Now, it is very clear that if the board of directors are clothed with the discretion to exclude African children from our common schools and require them to attend, and then they put in parentheses, if at all, in other words, require them to attend, but maybe they won't even require them to attend, if at all a school composed wholly of children of that nationality, they would have the same power to exclude German children from our common schools, require them to attend, if at all a school composed wholly of children of that nationality, and so of Irish, French, English, and other nationalities, which constitute the American. And he ta italicizes the word American. So what the court is saying is, what is America? It is a conglomeration of people from many different countries, many different ethnicities, many different languages, many different religions, and many different races. I should also note that in the 19th century and well into the 20th century, uh, at least up until around World War I, the term race is often used to designate what we would call ethnicity. So that uh, in around 1910, the Department of Labor publishes this book on the races of America. And there, because America is, is seeing huge numbers of immigrants from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, uh, from North Africa, from the Middle East, uh, the country is changing ethnically. And um, so this Department of Labor book has a chapter on the German race and the Italian race and the Jewish race and the Russian race and the Polish race. Um, and so in that sense, race and ethnicity are commingled. And so what the IO court is saying is the American people are governed into one harmonious people with a common country and stimulated with the common purpose to perpetuate and spread our free institutions for the development and education of the world, of actually, he says, the happiness of mankind. So here we have drumbeat trumpets coming from the Iowa Supreme Court saying the purpose of America is to have public education for everybody and to lead the world in this manner. And, and I will tell you that um, for much of the world that has always been the case. Uh, American higher education uh, with all of its problems and all of its difficulties remains the m most successful and most uh, loved system of higher education in the world. Vast numbers of people from everywhere want to come to American universities uh, because it has followed this model. 
If the word colored race be stricken from the answer, that is, if it be stricken from the answer of the city of Muscatine, which, by the way, says you can't integrate because the people of Muscatine will be uncomfortable if their kids go to school with black people. That is, the people of Muscatine are the white people. And if they go to school with the other folks who are black, they're going to be uncomfortable. And so the answer is the colored race, the colored race, the colored race. And the court says, you know, take out the word colored race and instead substitute English, Irish, or German. It would present precisely the same principle for our determination as now presented. It would only apply to a different race. Our statute does not either in letter or spirit recognize or justify any such distinction or limitations of the right or privilege on account of nationality. For the courts to sustain a board of school directors or subordinate board or officer in limiting the rights and privileges of persons by reason of their nationality would be to sanction a plain violation of the spirit of our laws not only, but would tend to perpetuate the national difference of our people and simul stimulate a constant strife if not a war of races. And so Susan Clark goes on to a secondary school and graduates from a secondary school in Muscatine, Iowa. And about, is it two years ago, you, you changed the name of the junior high? Yep. Uh, so about two years ago, I got contacted by Dan Clark and by Ken Sissel. And they said, um, we're going before the local school board to change the name of the junior high to the Susan Clark Junior High. And, and this guy got up and read it. And, and I had the honor, and I say this in all, I had the honor of being asked to write a statement about why this name should be changed. And this gentleman read it at the school board. So um, I am now in memori I am memorialized forever in the <laughs> archives of the Muscatine Board of Education. <laughs> and I thank you uh, for allowing me to do that. Um, because it's important. Because it's the right thing to do. So let's talk about Alexander Clark for a couple of minutes. Um, he's born in 1826 in Pennsylvania. Uh, he is, by this time, uh, Pennsylvania is a state which has a very, very tiny number of slaves. Pennsylvania is the first jurisdiction in the Western world. I don't know enough about the history of China or Japan or India to make the claim that it's the first jurisdiction in the world, but I think it probably is. It is the first jurisdiction, certainly in the Western world, to pass a law to begin to end slavery. No other place in the world had ever done this. And we should understand that when the 13 American colonies revolt against England in 1775, slavery is legal in every single one of these 13 colonies. There are slaves in every one of these colonies. And furthermore, there are slaves in every political jurisdiction from northern Quebec to Tierra del Fuego at the end of Argentina. The entire Western Hemisphere is full of slave jurisdictions, people in slavery. Now, if we backed up a couple of hundred years, we would discover slavery all over Southern Europe, all over much of Western Europe. The very word slave, here's your, here's your ultimate piece of trivia for tonight. Where does the, anybody know where the word slave comes from? So ancient Rome had slavery, but in ancient Rome a slave was, the, the term was service, which, which is Latin for somebody who serves. After the fall, and, and in ancient Rome there are slaves of all over the known world. Uh, all, all places where Roman armies went, slaves came back. That was one of the reasons why you attacked England or France or what's today Germany or uh, Egypt or the Middle East or Greece and, and east of Greece 
you brought slaves back with you. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the, uh, that source of slaves disappears, and southern Europe turns to another source of slaves, and uh, another way of acquiring slaves. And so in the 700s or 600s or 800s, the largest slave traders in the world, the center of the slave trading industry is Sweden and Norway. Are there any people here whose ancestors are Scandinavian? Those Vikings didn't just wear funny hats with horns. Those Vikings spent most of, much of their time getting into their boats and crossing the North Sea to what is today Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and the people who live there are Slavs. And so the great European slave trade of this period is Vikings bringing Slavs to Marseille and to Rome and to Athens and to Madrid and selling them as slaves. So if we could all get in a time machine uh, with Mr. Peabody, if you remember that wonderful show, and go back to you know, Rome in the year 800, we'd see a bunch of blue-eyed blonde people carrying heavy burdens and being whipped. And we'd say, who are those people? And they would answer, oh, those are Slavs. And so the word Slav and slave become interchangeable. By the year 1100, the word slave has crept into English, into French, esclavage, into what becomes Italian, into Spanish. Uh, and so slavery has always been with us. There is no country on earth with the exception of the aboriginals in Australia and the Inuit people, Eskimo people of the North Polar regions where there has not been slavery. Why are, isn't there slavery in either of those places? Because the food, food supply was so scarce, there was no value to have slaves. Otherwise, slaves are everywhere. And did Columbus bring slavery to America? No, because you only have to ask the Inca, the Aztec, the Maya, who own thousands and thousands of slaves. Slavery is everywhere. When the Portuguese circumnavigate Africa, they stop on the west coast of Africa, and what do they buy? They buy black slaves from other Africans. And people will sometimes say, well, why would Africans sell each other into slavery? And you might ask, why would Europeans sell each other into slavery, right? Uh, why would, um, you know, why would Italians go into France and round people up and bring them back as slaves? Because people aren't very nice, OK? The world is a nasty place. And so slavery is legal everywhere in the world. In the medieval period, and by the time of the revolution, slavery is legal in most of Western Europe. And even if you don't have slaves in your country, so England has said, well, you can't bring slaves into England. We don't want slavery. All of the British Empire, Jamaica, Barbados, Canada, the mainland American colonies, slavery is everywhere. Yes. Okay, so the question is, is there a difference between indentured servants and slaves? Is it? Uh, and the answer is, there's a huge difference. Engendered servitude is a way of bringing labor to the new world, which the English are very good at. Um, but it is almost entirely based on bringing your neighbors or people in your community to the new world. And indentures usually are between three and seven years. And the basic deal is, hey, you know, you're living on the streets of London and you're poor and you don't have any place to live and you're hungry all the time. Why don't you come to America and I'll feed you and clothe you and take care of you for five years. And then we'll give you some land or some money, um, depending, uh, or, or if you're a woman, we will give you some pots and pans and some other things so you can go get married and you can start your life all over again. That's the theory. 
the practice is not that pretty. Uh, and for most of the first 50 years of, of the settlement of Virginia, what happens to most indentured servants is they die before they finish their indenture, but then so do the people who brought them over because it's just you know, a very high death rate. But at the same time, indentured servitude becomes a way in some places of actually bringing community members over. So for example, um, in some parts of America, people get here, they get settled, and they write back and they say, I want to help my cousins come over, but I can't pay for their servant to come over for free. They got to work for me for three years, and then they're free. So it works out. But the, bi the real big difference is, is that the indentured servitude after the 1680s is almost always about Europeans indenturing other Europeans. The first blacks who come in 1619 are indentured servants. Some of them become free. One of them becomes a landowner eventually. So, so that's, but, but, but that's small, okay? So in any event, to go back now after this long detour into Swedish slave traders, which how many of you were surprised by that, by the way? Uh, yeah, I, you, ought, you ought to see the reactions when I teach about this in Minnesota. Uh, they think the Vikings are just a football team. Little do they know. Okay, so Alexander, so in 1780, the people in Pennsylvania have this brilliant idea that if we're fighting for our own liberty, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we really believe this stuff, we can't own our fellow human beings. So Pennsylvania passes a law which says, starting March 1st, 1780, every child in Pennsylvania will be born free, even if your parents are slaves. And there's an indenture. They have to serve for a number of years. But when they're done with that indenture, they get money, they get land, and they become free. And so Pennsylvania, literally, slavery will die out because as the existing slaves die, there will be no new slaves born. And when the children of slaves become adults, their children won't be endangered because they weren't slaves. So Pennsylvania, slavery is dying out. That's when Alexander Clark is born. Uh, he moves from uh, Pennsylvania to Cincinnati. And then from Cincinnati, when he's 16, he moves to um, Muscatine, Iowa. A little stop over in Illinois, a little stop over in various neighborhoods. Uh, so some of the folks here get really obsessed about, well, where did he live here? Where did he live here? I don't care. What happens is he ends up here. He ends up here, and he becomes a very hardworking guy. He's an entrepreneur. He sells wood to steamboats. Figures out if you go into the woods, chop down a tree, you can chop the tree into wood, sell it to a steamboat, make, make money. He sells wood. He starts importing dried fruit. Hey, you guys on the steamboat, you want some you know, dry, dried peaches? I have them for sale. And he becomes an entrepreneur. He's also a barber, and he opens up a barber shop. He becomes a real estate broker, an investor in real estate, a newspaper editor, a lawyer a leader of the Prince Hall Masons, which is the single most important fraternal organization for African Americans at this time. He becomes an activist as a lay leader in the African American, African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. Uh, he becomes a political activist in Iowa. Even before he can vote, he is organizing politically. And this, again, is really fascinating because blacks can't vote in Iowa either under the first or second constitution, but Clark is agitating, is, is arguing, he's demanding that we people have a right to vote just like everybody else in the state. Uh, he is a staunch abolitionist. He attends abolitionist conventions around the country. In 1853, he goes to the Colored National Convention in Rochester, New York, which of course is the home of Frederick Douglass. Uh, he meets Douglas during the Civil War. He organizes and recruits for the 
1st Regiment of Iowa African Infantry. And by the way, I find it fascinating that they are African since nobody in that infantry had been born in Africa and probably uh, nor had their parents been born in Africa, but they are of African ancestry infantry. Uh, he initially recruits 50 men, paying them each $2 signing bonuses out of his own pocket. By the way, this suggests how, how successful Alexander Clark is, that he can afford to spend 100 bucks recruiting people. $100 is a lot of money in those days. Uh, you know, and, and so he's, um, he's moving along. Eventually, about 1,000 African Americans will join this regiment. Uh, it will later be renamed the 60th USCT Regiment. USD stands for United States Colored Troops. Uh, his regiment elects him Sergeant Major, which is the highest non-commissioned rank in the regiment. But he fails his physical, and he can't actually serve in the Army. Uh, and so he goes back to Muscatine, and he proceeds to continue to organize, to continue to recruit, to continue to be political. Um, at the same time that he's arguing for the desegregation of schools, he's also arguing for black suffrage. And this again makes Alexander Clark really different than almost everybody else in the country. At the time of the Civil War, free blacks can vote in all of the New England states except Connecticut. And there are no slaves in these states any longer, so it's really African Americans can vote in all of the New England states except Connecticut. They can vote in New York if they own property, although whites no, no longer have to own property to vote. Um, but people like Frederick Douglass can vote. They can vote weirdly in Michigan elections involving uh, school budgets, because the school budgets are based on property taxes. And there is a county in western Michigan that has so many black landowners that if the blacks can't vote, they can't get a majority of the taxpayers to vote for the school board budget. So Michigan doesn't allow blacks to vote in any election except black property owners, like white property owners, can vote in, uh, in, in elections to vote for the, for the school budget. Uh, but other than that, blacks can't vote in America. Um, they can hold public office in some places. Oddly, um, John Mercer Langston, a black lawyer in Ohio, is elected county attorney, even though he can't vote for himself. Because when Ohio put, writes its constitution, they say only white people can vote. And somebody proposes only white people can hold office. And the rest of the convention delegates said, well, that would be undemocratic. Because if the people are stupid enough to elect a black, that's their democratic right. And, and of course, Americans have always had the right to stupidly elect <laughs> stupid people to office. Um, but the end result is, is John Mercer Langston, who is a very good lawyer, becomes a county attorney. He later becomes a congressman after the Civil War. And then he becomes the dean of Howard Law School, which is the first, uh, one of the earliest black universities in the United States. So while he's fighting for his daughter to go to school, he is also fighting for Iowa to change its constitution. And in 1868, Iowa's entirely white electorate no black can vote, approves a series of state constitutional amendment to remove the word white from five clauses of the old 1857 Constitution. And oddly, they forget to include the word white when regulating the state House of Representatives. So you could be a black senator in Iowa, you could be governor, you could be a voter, but they just left off the clause on members of the House of Representatives, so only whites can be in the Iowa House of Representatives. And because of the, the complexity of the Iowa amendment process, where an amendment has to be passed 
two years in a row by the state legislature and then sent to the electorate, they don't finally get around to removing that last word of white until 1880. But in 1868, Iowa becomes the first state west of the Atlantic coast to give equal suffrage to blacks. And it is the first state to do so in the whole United States since the Civil War. In 1870, the US Constitution will be amended. And so it will prohibit discrimination in voting on the basis of race. But Iowa beats the rest of the country by two years. And again, this is pretty extraordinary. This is astounding in, in some ways. And when we look at the debate in this, when we look at the lobbying for this, this guy's there all the time. He's buttonholing legislators. He is, he is organizing whites and blacks to send petitions to end voting discrimination. And of course, part of Alexander's Clark's Part of Alexander Clark's argument is that 200,000 African Americans had served in the Civil War, fighting to preserve the Union, fighting to destroy slavery. How can you tell us that we can die for the country, but we can't vote in the country? And that's the winning argument in Iowa, and it sets the stage in part for the winning argument in uh, the rest of the country. In 1869, he is elected vice president of the Iowa State Republican Convention. The Republican Party, of course, of the 1860s is the anti-slavery party. It's the party of Lincoln. It's the party of racial integration. It's a party of equality. Uh, and it's still pretty remarkable that in 1869, when there is not universal black suffrage yet because 15th Amendment hasn't been ratified, the Iowa Republican Convention makes him a vice president. In 1872, he is sent to the National Republican Convention from Iowa to renominate Ulysses Grant. And in 1873, Grant offers him a position as US consul to Haiti. This is, you know, an amazing opportunity. And he looks at it and he says, well, given the salary, it's really not all that amazing. I can't afford to take the financial hit to become an ambassador. And so he declines Grant's offer and he returns to Iowa where he is a prosperous businessman. And he's actually probably the second wealthiest black in, in Iowa, but he's also clearly the most prominent. And so this is kind of the history of Alexander Clark. After the war, he organizes Prince Hall Mason Lodges, the Clark Lodge, Clark Lodge number six in Muscatine. He organizes one in Keokuk, Des Moines, Burlington, Oskaloosa, and ultimately he creates the Iowa Grand Lodge uh, because initially the Iowa Prince Hall Masons are under the uh, auspices of the Missouri Grand Lodge, then they get their own state large lodge. And Clark becomes a major figure traveling up and down the Mississippi River involved in this fraternal work. In 1878, his son Alexander Griffin Clark, also known as Alexander Clark Jr., becomes the first black to graduate from uh, the University of Iowa Law School. But by the way, there, there's a weird phenomenon here. He is not Alexander G. Clark. There is no Alexander G. Clark. He is Alexander Clark. He has no middle name. He never signs his name with a middle name. Uh, the G creeps in there, I think, in the early 20th century, actually. Uh, and the reason for that is because his son, Alexander Griffin Clark, he gets the Griffin from his mother's family name, but he's known as Junior. And we think today that to be junior, you have to have the exact same name as the father. But in those days, you didn't. They just kind of, they don't follow the same rules. So people assume, well, if Alexander G. Clark is junior, then this must be Alexander G. Clark Sr. But the G doesn't belong there. Take it out, get an eraser, <laughs> clean it up. 
Okay, so Alexander Griffin Clark becomes the first black to graduate University of Iowa Law School. Alexander Clark becomes the second black as an adult male, having never gone to college, having never gone to high school, Alexander Clark manages to graduate from the Iowa Law School. Uh, and he uh, practices law in both Iowa and Illinois. In 1882, he becomes the co-owner of a newspaper, the Chicago Conservator, um, which is the first black-owned newspaper in Chicago. Uh, in 1886, he becomes the treasurer and chair of the executive committee of the National Press Association, which is like AP uh, today for black newspapers. And he, at this point, has a co-owner of the conservator, a man named Ferdinand Barnett, who, like Clark, is also a black lawyer. Uh, Barnett will eventually become the first black assistant state's attorney general, state's attorney in, in, Iowa, in Illinois in 1896. And more importantly, in 1895, Ferdinand Barnett will marry the very, very famous anti-lynching um, activist Ida Bell Wells, who then becomes known as Ida B. Wells Barnett. So this is an example of a guy who's pretty successful and he's completely forgotten and we only remember his wife, who was enormously important and successful. Uh, by this time, of course, Clark has passed on, um, but he had been uh, Barnett's partner in the newspaper business. Um, starting in the administration of Garfield in 1881, Clark begins to lobby for a federal position. He wants to become recorder of the deeds of Washington, D.C., uh, which had been Frederick Douglass's job. One reason for that is because in this period, if you are a public official, uh, like the recorder of the deeds, or if, you had, if they'd had driver's licenses, if you're the person who gives driver's license, you get paid for everything you do. So every time he signs his name to a deed, a little bit of money legally slips into his pocket. It's a very lucrative job. You can get really wealthy being the recorder of the deeds in any city, especially Washington, D.C. That never materializes. But in 1890, Benjamin, Frank, Har Benjamin Harrison, I'm sorry, Benjamin Harrison, who is, of course, the grandson of William Henry Harrison, who had been governor of Ohio, William Henry Harrison is a lifetime slave owner, comes from a big slave owning family in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, he's a hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, uh, fighting Indians, and then he becomes a uh, uh, governor of the Ohio Territory, later a senator, later president. Uh, his grandson becomes president as well, um, and Benjamin Harrison, the grandson, is a uh, U.S. Army general during the Civil War, and Harrison appoints Clark to be the U.S. Consul General in Monrovia, in Liberia, uh, in early 1890. He gets there, in November 1890, he gets there, and by May he has died. Uh, sadly, <coughs> getting posted in Liberia was not a safe position because of the disease climate, uh, Americans simply weren't prepared to survive in West Africa uh, before the invention of, um, dare I say it, vaccines? Can you say vaccine in Iowa? I'm not sure. But in any event, uh, uh, before the invention of vaccines, uh, it's not a safe place to go to. Uh, and so Clark dies. When he dies, by the way, there's a very interesting editorial in the um, in a Washington D.C. newspaper, which complains bitterly about Clark being appointed to the position in Liberia, and the newspaper essentially says somebody of Clark's age and Clark's importance should not have his life destroyed by being appointed to this very physically dangerous place because of the disease. And one wonders, in fact, had Clark not gone to Liberia as an attorney, as a successful businessman, it's hard to know where he would have ended up. He could have been the first black federal judge in America. Uh, he could have been the first black judge in the state of Iowa. 
but sadly he dies as a young man. So this is who we're commemorating, this is who we're talking about, and it is important to understand that for a variety of reasons, he is an important and significant figure in the history of the United States and really a giant in the history of Iowa. Uh, and let me leave it at that and take any questions any of you have. And you better ask questions because it's all going to be on the exam. Yeah. I'm curious, you talked about um, that he found a good lawyer for the Clark versus, uh, not Board of Education, the Board of Directors. Yeah. Do we know anything about that lawyer? You know, um, it's one of the things that I want to know more about. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Ken Sissel and Dan Clark and the others, uh, but by, by the way, it's interesting to even be doing this talk here because Kent has been, owns the Clark House. He has been involved in Clark for a significant portion of his adult life. Dan writes a column in the newspaper on Clark every half hour. Uh, and uh, well done. Dan has a repository of stuff. I rely on them. They're my research assistants. Uh, because they know a lot of factual stuff that I don't. So one of the things that I actually have to get with Dan and, and, and Kent about is who takes this case. I probably have it somewhere in my notes. Um, but that's the best answer. But Dan, you want to answer? <clears throat> Will I get on the live stream if I don't walk up here? Because <laughs> I want to, before I do that, I want to tell them about what I handed you just as we walked in. Mike Ferguson, who was a reporter at the Muscatine Journal. Mike, uh, do I need a mic? No. Mike Ferguson was a reporter at the Muscatine Journal uh, in 2010 when Paul spoke here the first time. Mike uh, wrote really nice stories about Paul Finkelman. He is now an editor for the Presbyterian Church USA based in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, within an hour before this show started, he posted on Facebook that he was really looking forward to hearing Dr. Finkelman tonight. And I said, Mike, you wrote nice things the first time he was here. And he said, and now, now I've admired him for a long time. I wanted you to know that. Um, the, I would have to look up quickly to see which Richmond, do you remember, Kent? One was the judge and the other was the lawyer. They talk about an inside deal. So there were these two brothers practicing law here in town. One was the local judge, so when the case go, when So when Alexander files the suit on behalf of his daughter, uh, the local magistrate, the, well, he was a district court judge, the local judge ruled in Clark's favor. That was one of the Richmond brothers. I have to look up which one it was. Uh, I, D.C. Richmond, I think, was the attorney. I, I think you're right. And, and D. Richmond. Scott Richmond, I think, was the judge. I, be I believe. Richmond. We'd have to look it up. So, so the local judge rules in their favor. By the way, the school board was all Republicans. I want to say this quickly. There had been a contentious school board election just a few months before, and the Republicans, who, yes, were the party of Lincoln, uh, were running. It was a close race. A lot of copperheads around still, uh, uh, Democrats, you know. And uh, so there was, a, there was sort of a litmus test. They all took the pledge, no, we won't mix the races, we won't make your kid sit by a black kid. They had just won their election. And the school number two was looking for a principal. They hired a new principal in August. In September, Alexander sends his kid, at least one, maybe two, to the school. And here's this poor guy, I mean, I, mean, I feel for him, who says, I, I've got my orders, I'm sorry, you can't. So the, the Republican newspaper, the Muscatine Journal, doesn't even back their Republican school board. They write a, an editorial called Man's Inhumanity to Man and, and, and skewer the school board. Judge Richmond rules in favor of the Clarks. It goes on appeal. Uh, the school board appeals and it goes to the Supreme Court. We found a, you've got this I think, 
in the Yale Law Library. There's a copy of the handwritten note. Uh, there was no ruling, you know, that went to the court, but a handwritten note from Judge Richmond to Judge Cole, I think. Yeah, the chief judge of the, of the state. Saying, so, you know, here's how I ruled, and one, two, three, four, here's why. And then basically that turns into the ruling. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, the other person I want to mention is that as it goes to the state, one of Clark's attorneys is a guy named Henry O'Connor, we should know a lot more about here. His house still exists at the top of West Hill. It ought to have its own plaque. Uh, Henry O'Connor was famous for a lot of reasons, but long and short of it, uh, he got elected uh, Attorney General of Iowa right about the time of the Clark case, right after he and Clark were making speeches at rallies in favor of um, those changes to the Constitution. Well, Thanks, Paul. Clark also had another lifelong attorney whose name was Jerome Karskandon. Karskandon House is on West 2nd, and the, the, uh, the colonial, Southern Colonial House uh, in about the 500, 600 block. The carriage step is still in front of the house, and it says Karskandon. Jerome Karskandon was Alexander's personal attorney throughout uh, Alexander's entire life. Okay, other questions? Yes, in the back. Just a comment, Kent, do you know if Carter Scadden was a relative of Bob Bishop, who was a uh, relative of, of the Burge of L.G. Berry Company? Yes. <laughs> I do know, and yes, he was. <laughs> from, from, um, Jerome, uh, from Jerry Bishop's first marriage. Yes. Mariana was yes. Jerry's second wife. Other questions? I thought there was a hand. A hand in the back, and then the man with the, the suspenders. You're first in the back. I had a question. I'm going to turn the clock back to that. My, my, my brother with the braces. To uh, Ulysses S. Grant's administration. And sure. You talked about uh, how Grant picked Alexander to be an ambassador to Haiti. And I think Grant was on board with a an idea that was loose in the landscape back in the 1870s to recolonize blacks because they really didn't, America really was unsure, what do we do now with all these new freedoms and all these things? Why not approach African Americans with the idea of recolonization, be it Haiti, Liberia? Was, was Clark- Okay, there? okay. Was so, so let me just briefly respond to that in a couple of ways. Um, when uh, Thomas Jefferson acquired the Louisiana Purchase, uh, one of his goals was to find a place to send free black people. Uh, another goal was to find a place to send Indians, and he does, in, in a, which becomes Oklahoma. Uh, Jefferson, of course, was a thoroughgoing racist. He hated the very idea of free black people. He despised the notion of free black people. Uh, he loved slavery. He buys and sells human beings his entire life. And his notion of colonization, as it's called, is let's send them someplace else. In 1817, something called the American Colonization Society is founded. And there are two streams of the colonization society. One stream are people like Jefferson who simply want to get rid of free black people. And the other are people who think that if we have colonization, some slave owners will free their slaves and send them to Liberia. They're better to be free in Liberia than they would be in, uh, in slaves in Virginia. Uh, the very idea, of course, that black people should go back to Africa uh, is you know, deeply racist, fundamentally racist. Um, I can say I uh, have visited Poland once. My grandmother's from Poland. I don't want to go back there. That's not my country. I don't know the language. Uh, I don't know the customs. Uh, and I'm sure that most of the people in this room have ancestors from somewhere else, and you're not packing up to go back to your homeland. And African Americans almost universally say over and over again, this is our country. And they are almost universally opposed to colonization because they correctly see it as booting us out of the country that we helped build. 
you know? Black soldiers die at Lexington and Concord. One of the heroes of the Battle of Bunker Hill is a black soldier who shoots a British major. One third of Washington's army is black at the end of the revolution. They are patriots. It is their country. Uh, Grant is a thoroughgoing opponent of slavery. Grant absolutely despises slavery. Grant embraces the notion of black soldiers in the army. And during the Civil War, once black soldiers are in combat, the Confederates, revealing who they really are, revealing what really matters to them, says that we, we will not exchange black prisoners uh, in, in prisoner exchanges, which is kind of stupid. I mean, look, if, if they think blacks are inferior, why wouldn't they want to exchange an inferior black soldier for a wonderful, proud Confederate soldier, right? But no, they won't exchange black soldiers. Grant says, fine, there will be no more prisoner exchanges, period. Either all American soldiers are eligible for a prisoner exchange or none are. That's, that's the rule. Grant appoints blacks to high office. Uh, by the way, if any of you ever see a picture of the signing of Lee's surrender at Appomattox, there's a famous painting. It's, it's completely fraudulent. I mean, there's no painter there. There's no photograph. But it, it has all the right people. You will notice standing behind Black is a very dark-skinned man. He's not African-American. He's a Seneca Indian. And he is a full colonel on Grant's staff, and he will later become a general. And then when Grant is president, um, he will be appointed to uh, be the first um, Native American Secretary of Indian Affairs. Uh, so Grant is an egalitarian. Grant is not pushing for colonization. Uh, there are some people who are. And after the Civil War, there are a small number of, of blacks who say, you know, I'm fed up with this country. Does it hasn't done anything for me. Maybe going to Haiti is a good idea. But that's always a very, very small minority of blacks. Yes, sir. You're next. Two questions. One is how old was Alexander Clark when he died? And the second one is can you give us a little history on what happened with Susan Clark. Um, so Alexander Clark um, uh, when he dies, is um, ni he dies in 91. Minus 26. So, so he's born in 1926. So you can do the math. Uh, Susan Clark graduates, marries a black minister. Uh, I can't remember where she moves to. She moves to Cedar Rapids. And to Keokuk. She lives a whole bunch of places. With okay. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman and then you. Uh, this is an aside rather than a question, but the American slaves who were repatriated to Liberia, which is essentially a country we created, but never recognized until after the Civil War, um, those people became a ruling class yes. and the oppressive class of the Native Africans. Yes, they... yes. Which just shows that human beings are mostly nasty, except for the people in this room. Uh, and, and yeah, yes. And, and in, in fact, so when, when Jefferson is president, Haiti is an independent republic. And Jefferson refuses to allow diplomatic recognition for Haiti. And his son-in-law, who is in Congress on the floor of the House of Representatives, says that he is willing to spend the United States into bankruptcy to destroy the black republic. And that becomes the American policy until 1862, when the United States gives diplomatic recognition to both Haiti and um, Liberia. Question here. Do we know what brought him here in the first place? Was Pardon? Do we know what brought him here in the first place? Here meaning right. Clark? Yeah. A steamboat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. Uh, Alexander Clark uh, became a bartender on the steamboat, George Washington, and then it went up and down the Mississippi and eventually landed here on the George Washington. And he, had been a, he made a lot of money in tips as a bartender. And the story at one point said that on many of the, the steamboats, there were black bartenders. It was a great way to make money. And he was like 15. He's six, he gets here, he's about, he's about 16 when he gets here, yeah. Um, but, but, but you know, there, there's, the, there's the famous, there's the famous um, um, scene in the, in the Beatles movie, uh, uh, A Hard Day's Night, where, where some reporter says, how did, how did you find America? How do you find America? He said, you turn left at Greenland. You know, so um, <laughs> yeah, he came, but, but, but in Clark's case, yeah, what brought him here was a steamboat. And this was a place where he got off. And, and by the way, much of American history is the serendipitous event that you got off a steamboat here and not here. Or that you, your, your, your train ended up here rather than here. There are all sorts of stories of immigrants who end up in really unexpected places. And that's because they were told to go to Pittsburgh when they got to the United States and so they ended up in Pittsburgh, Kansas instead of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania because they didn't really know where they were going. Uh, I want to add one more thing to sort of close all this out uh, because you've been a very patient audience and there's uh, food there. Unfortunately, uh, nobody's tending bar but we'll get, we'll get beyond that. Um, Clark versus Board of Directors has been cited in 42 different cases in the United States. It's twice been cited by the US Supreme Court. It's twice been cited by US Courts of Appeals. It has been cited in Illinois, Kansas, Louisiana, New York, Oklahoma, West Virginia. Uh, in the briefs for Brown versus Board of Education, it is cited in five different briefs arguing for school integration. But the most interesting case of all is a case called Ferguson versus Geis. Ferguson is a businessman in Detroit. He goes to a fancy restaurant in Detroit with the catcher from the visiting Syracuse baseball team. Both Ferguson and the catcher are black. This is 1889 when blacks could still play professional baseball. And he goes to this restaurant and the owner of the restaurant does not allow him to sit in the dining room. He says you have to sit at the, in the room where the bar is. Uh, at a regular table, you can't have a tablecloth. He says, you can order off the main dining room menu, but you can't sit there. Ferguson sues, goes to the Michigan Supreme Court. The Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court only has one arm. He left the other one at the Battle of Chickamauga. He is a one-armed Union veteran. And he writes a scathing opinion in which he says, we did not sacrifice so much treasure and blood so that people could discriminate on the basis of race. And what does he cite for his argument? Clark versus Board of Directors. Uh, Clark versus Board of Directors has been cited in the Iowa Supreme Court, just to give you a sense, in 2021, twice in 2020, once in 2017, once in 2014, once in 1917, once in 1910. As recently as 2013, uh, it's cited in, a, uh, in an opinion in the US Supreme Court. Uh, Clark versus Board of Directors is the basis for Iowa 
to again lead the nation in equality and human justice in its decision that allows people to marry whoever they love without regard to what the gender of the person is that they're marrying. And that happens before the US Supreme Court reaches the same conclusion. It is a significant case. It should be in the pantheon of American liberty. Um, and I have, of course, cited it in a number of law review articles because it's the right thing to cite. <laughs> but it's also the right thing to educate the American Academy about the importance of the case. Again, thank you. I thank the school. Well, thank you so very much for joining us and for keeping the history of Alexander Clark alive. Um, by continuing conversations and continuing your interest. Um, I heard that uh, this would be quite a day when we, I would get to hear Dr. Paul Finkelman speak, and uh, it was a, a wonderful day, all of the contributions to our community and to our students. So thank you so very much. We do have some refreshments. We'd like you to uh, stay and, and mingle. Um, thank you for being on our campus. I, I, I just realized I need to say one more thing. I'm wearing a medal that Kent Sissel said that I could wear. It is from the Iowa African American Hall of Fame that was given to Kent when Alexander Clark was inducted into the Iowa African American Hall of Fame. And so he asked me if I would like to wear it uh, when I gave this talk. And again, it's an honor uh, to be allowed to wear his medal. Sadly, I think he wants me to give it back to him. <laughs>